During the month of November, we will be meeting in the Fellowship Hall at 5 o'clock for prayer. I would encourage you guys to come and join us, if you would, uh, in a time of prayer. I think there's plenty to pray about, um, so it's not like we lack topics. So it's always good to come together as a church and spend time in prayer. And of course, join us for a meal after prayer, and then Bible study after that. We'd love to have you all come out. So go ahead, please, and open your Bible up to the book of Matthew, chapter 26. We are rapidly approaching the time in our Gospel of Matthew where Jesus will be going to the cross. And we've seen in these last two chapters so many things that he's told us about concerning the last days, concerning what we should do during the last days, how we should be living our lives. And I, and I love God's word because it doesn't matter if it's 2,000 or 4,000 years old, you know it's relevant right now in our lives. It speaks to us right where we are in our lives. And I love that because it's not just a history book that we're reading. It's a book that was written by the Holy Spirit. So as we continue on in our study, I want to start in chapter 26, verse 1, and I'm going to read down to verse 16. It came to pass, when Jesus finished these sayings, that he said to his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And then the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flask of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, and they said, Why this waste? For this fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. But when Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? For she has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not have always. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, Are you still willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Or what are you willing to give me? And they counted out to him thirty pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. So we see things moving very, very fast here as we begin to go through this. And it's interesting that uh, it tells us in verse 1 that when Jesus finished these sayings, that he turned his attention to his disciples. Now, I love that phrase, uh, it, it came to pass. And we think of that as, you know, as time goes on in the Bible, these different events happen. I've always looked at this and thought, you know, whatever we're going through right now, it came to pass, and it will pass. And to me, that's encouraging because it doesn't matter what kind of burden we might be carrying this morning. I know for sure that God is able to take it. I know for sure that God is able to handle that burden that we can't handle when the weight is just too heavy. So remember that when you're going through tough times. It came, but it will pass. It came to pass. And there's always a reason in that, isn't there? God doesn't do anything just out of the you know, uh, wants to mess up with our heads or anything like that. Everything he does 
to us, in us, around us. He does that to help make us stronger. He does it to benefit us because he has our best interest at heart. Do you believe that this morning? He has your best interest at heart personally. So after he had finished these sayings, and basically it shows us here that he was speaking to a large group of people evidently because it says after he had spoke these things, he turns his attention to a specific group of people, the 12, the disciples, the 12 disciples. The word disciple means to be disciplined. That's what the word actually means, disciplined one. It means to be a person who has um, studied the word. A person who spends time in the Word. A person who's disciplined his life to walk in the Lord's grace and in his will. And to know what his will is. I've had people from time to time come to me and say, how do you know what God's will is for you or for your life? You know, James says, if you lack wisdom, ask. You know, and God will reveal it to you. And I think sometimes when it comes to what is God's will for me, sometimes, you know, it can become very childlike. You know, God, do I want to get the blue car or the red car? What's your will? You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes we take it a little bit too far. Sometimes the Lord is saying, I'll leave that up to you, right? We get to choose. But according to God's will, what's going on in my life? What is his will for my life? Well, mainly our position in Christ is to glorify his name and to represent him and to be his disciples, his disciplined ones, his children. And so he turns his attention to this group of men who truly are uh, learning how to be disciplined in the Lord. He says in verse 2 that after two days is the Passover. And the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So as he's turning now, his, uh, you know, he had, you might remember in chapter 24, they asked Jesus three questions. And in the last two chapters, he's been answering those three questions. Um, And then now, as he's finished with that teaching, now he's turning his attention towards the cross. And he's very clear on the fact that in two days, He was going to die. You know, it's interesting because a lot of people really don't understand the Passover. A lot of people just pass over it as though it's old and we don't need to look at it anymore because after all, it's Old Testament stuff. But it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of Christ and what Christ came to do. And it's amazing that for, you know, thousands of years, the the Jewish people have been celebrating the Passover, but they can't seem to find Jesus in there. And the nice thing to know this morning about that is that there will be a day coming soon when their eyes will be opened and they will recognize him as the Messiah. What a great day that'll be when his covenant people finally acknowledge who he is. And that day will come, and I think that that day is pretty darn close. So Jesus now is turning his attention. How would you feel if you knew that in two days you were going to suffer some of the worst torturous pain and agony that you ever even imagined, that you could not even imagine? What would you be thinking about right now? What would your plans be for the next two days? Kind of frightening to think of that, isn't it? It's almost like somebody who's sitting on maybe death row and their time has come and they got two days to live. What are they going to do with their time? Well, I can guarantee you a lot of those fellows are on their knees. A lot of those fellows are asking God for forgiveness. But you know, the Lord does not change his focus whatsoever. He could have avoided the cross very easily. He could have just went around it. He could have never been crucified. But he chose to do that because he knew that's why he came to this planet. That's why he was here to die. And he was here to die on our behalf. And he also, in verse 2, specifies the manner of his death. When he says he will be delivered up to be crucified. 
And then verse 3 says that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas. And they plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. They didn't want to cause a riot. They'd already had enough problems with riots and uh, confrontation with the Romans. And, you know, their life was difficult. They were oppressed people. They were being pressed all the time um, by the Roman Empire who occupied Israel and basically ran everything in Israel. It was so controlled by them that actually the Jewish people didn't even have the authority to crucify. They had to go through the Romans to get that permission in order to do that, which they did by going to Pilate, and we're going to look at all that in the next few weeks. But who is this guy, Caiaphas? He seems to be a pretty important fella. He's called the high priest, the high priest of the Jews. Now, in the Old Testament, the high priest, he had an obligation, he had a job, his purpose was to go in before God and represent the people, Israel, and to go in and make atonement for their sins. And so once a year, that's what he would do. Now, during the year, families would come and they would bring their, their, uh, their offering to the temple and there would be sacrifices made. But there was this one main day during the year when the high priest would enter into the temple and he would go into a part of the temple that was forbidden for anybody else to go into. It's called the Holy of Holies. Now, the priest, the high priest, he had to make sure that he had himself together before he went in that part of the temple. Because if he wasn't, if he was harboring some kind of sin or something like that, uh, then he would be immediately taken out. As a matter of fact, it was so serious, I understand, and I don't know that it's not in the Scripture, but I understand that they actually would... uh, put bells on the bottom of the robe of the high priest. And as he's moving about and doing his business in the Holy of Holies, you could hear the little bells tingling. And I guess if they stopped tingling, they had a rope tied around his ankle. And if they stopped tingling and he got taken out, then they literally would drag him out with the rope because they couldn't enter into the Holy of Holies. So what's the significance of that? The significance is in that is that you and I, apart from Jesus Christ, have no way that we can ever enter in to the holy place. Only through Jesus can we do that. Now, the high priest was a picture of that. The shedding of the animal's blood was a picture of that. But the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus, yes, he is our Messiah. Yes, he is God. And also, he's the Passover lamb, right? He is the sacrifice. And he's the high priest. He's all of these things combined. So being the high priest, it tells us that Jesus entered in one time for all. And that's all it took. As he goes to the cross, as he enters in, as he gives his life, as he sheds his blood, he's opening up a brand new time in history for the human race. We're going to see how that the curtain that was within the temple there was torn from the top down. Now, there's only one way that can happen. It had to be the hand of God. And by tearing that curtain, he was saying, there's no longer any boundaries. You, common folk... We can now enter the Holy of Holies because our high priest made that possible. When God the Father looks at you, even at this moment right now, you know what he sees? He doesn't see your faults so much because it's covered by the blood of Jesus. He sees the righteousness of Christ, almost like an outfit that we wear, a righteous robe that we wear. We saw last week that when When Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, that the the ones who come with him are going to be wearing white robes. That's us, purified. And this is what the Father sees when he looks at you, even at this moment. I know it's hard from our perspective to understand that because we always see things on this kind of a plane here. But positionally, God is looking at you and I as already completely saved, We're already residents of heaven. We're just waiting for the moment where we can now enter in 
for eternity to be with the Lord. And the only way that was possible, because the Father will not tolerate sin in his presence. So we were all disqualified. We were all unworthy. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So this idea of going in with the high priest, having this job, if you will, he's literally, when you think about it, he's representing Jesus as he enters into the Holy of Holies. It's a picture of what Jesus would do. And they did it for thousands of years. Well, there was a time during the Old Testament period where they didn't have a Passover for many, many, many years But once it was reinstituted, that's exactly what would happen. So Caiaphas, he is this high priest that is to pretty much be a picture of Jesus. Well, he's anything but a picture of Jesus. He's a political egomaniac who wants to just have control and power over people. Now, his father was also the high priest. But in about AD 18, the Romans appointed Caiaphas um, and his father-in-law, Annas, to be high priests over Israel. But they were political pawns. They were controlled by the Romans. They were high priests. These two guys were the high priests when John was beginning his preaching and his ministry. So they had been around a while. And now Jesus is having to deal with these men who are out to get him. And look where they go. They go to the palace, not to the house. Caiaphas didn't live in a house. He lived in a palace, right? Nice. Nice way to live. They assemble there to figure out how they can take this guy out who poses a threat to their authority. Isn't it sad? Because really all Jesus did was that he didn't pose a threat to their authority. He was there to say, I am the authority. You're just a picture of that. But they felt threatened. And you know what? People who don't know Christ, people who perhaps have an ulterior motive in their hearts for maybe wanting to be in ministry or have a church or go on missions or whatever it might be, But they're doing it to look good. They're doing it so they might get the praise of men. They're doing it because they can have some power in doing that. And these men fed on that very thing. Now we saw earlier in our in our gospel where Jesus had this friend named Lazarus who died, and he went and rose this guy from the dead. He'd been in the tomb long enough that he started stinking. Right? And he calls him up out of the grave. And this is only a few miles from Jerusalem when this happened. And so, of course, the high priests get, get wind of it. They see it, and they are more threatened now uh, than ever because this man is said to have, notice, he's said to have raised Lazarus from the dead. So Caiaphas, he has a lot of authority in his words, and his counsel was followed. So really, he's the instigator of the plan that's going to be hatched. But they want to be very careful because they know the Romans are watching. They know that there's been violence in the past already. And they don't want to do this uh, during the Passover. They want to wait till after, when things have calmed down and some of those millions of people have gone back home again because the, the population in Jerusalem would swell to huge numbers during this time. People would come from different villages and from all over land, the land to, to take part and be a part of the, the Passover feast. So they're asking, or they're suggesting, that perhaps we need to wait a few days. Let's wait till after the holiday. Because if we do it on the holiday or right before it, everyone, all of his followers are going to rebel and rise up and it's not going to be a pretty scene. They're being tactful here. But you know what? God already has a plan. And they can't thwart the plan. Jesus already knows the day he's going to be crucified. He is the Lamb of God. 
And because he's the Lamb of God, they will be crucifying him on the very day when they would sacrifice lambs for their own sin. The picture, the shadow, if you will. Now, the Sanhedrin was also another political uh, religious party, if you will, in Israel. There were a group of guys that, that had a lot of authority and a lot of power, and they were always the ones um, who would take care of religious issues, uh, uh, civil issues, criminal issues, um, matters with other foreign nations, um, all kinds of different things that they would be involved in trying to keep everything together. And the Sanhedrin uh, were exercising their power when they charged Jesus with a crime. Now, it's pretty hard to take a person who hasn't committed a crime and drum up some false charges so that you might get them into the court and have them found guilty of a crime that perhaps they didn't even commit. Now, what would that do? Well, that would discredit him. That would show him to the people that he's a criminal and nothing more. So don't support him. Don't believe in him. He's a farce. And, and the wonderful Sanhedrin, 71 of us are here to protect you from that horrible man. Kind of sounds familiar in a way. but uh, So they're plotting. And, 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 they, and the NIV uses the word sly. They want, to, they want to be sly in their tactics, sneaky, if you will. They want to come in and plot against him. Now, again, I think that there can be a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus. Some of us think, you know, it just it wasn't fair. Poor guy was outnumbered. He got betrayed by one of his friends and put up on that horrible cross and tortured and died. And, oh, what a horrible thing. You think it took him by surprise? You think that maybe he was caught up in a successful ministry and all these people that loved him and everywhere he went, people would come and multitudes would come to hear him speak and now all of a sudden, it's going to come to an end? You think he was bummed? Taken by surprise maybe? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the truth is, that's why I said earlier, this is why he came. This wasn't a surprise for him. He knew that he was going to die. And at this juncture, he knew when he was going to die. Man's plans will never thwart God's plans. Never. Their plan was to try to wait, to do it secretly and quietly. God's plan was totally different. You cannot stand against God and come out the winner ever. Because good and truth and love will always prevail. Amen? I hope you believe that today. So being the fact that Jesus was crucified on the very day of Passover, we have to ask, who's in control of this stuff? Really? Is it men? Is it these 71 fellows? Absolutely not. God has a plan. And just like he had a plan for Jesus, had a plan he has a plan for us too. And I think that's where it kind of turns around and it starts looking right back at us, thinking, okay, have you discovered God's plan for your life? I want to encourage you, if you haven't, seek it out and you will find it. You know, God's always hiring. He is. He's always looking for good people to represent him. And a lot of times we feel this little tug in our hearts, maybe, that God might say, you know, you're thinking, oh, maybe I ought to get involved in this or get involved in that, you know. And then right away you start thinking, no, I couldn't do that. I, I'm not experienced in that area. I'm not qualified. And so I'll just, you know, keep my mouth shut and stay in the shadows where it's safe, right? God wants us to step out. He always helps us when we step out. Now, the very first Passover, we know all about it. I just want to read a couple of verses to you, though. If you'll flip over with me, if you can, we're going to put it up on the screen, I believe. Uh, we're going to be over in Isaiah chapter 53. And in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verse 5 through 7, I want to read it to you. Speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, it says that he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities. 
And the chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. All of we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. So we have this beautiful prophecy from Isaiah concerning this servant of God. Behold, my servant, whom I'm going to send. And the whole chapter 53, and I'm sure a lot of you know this, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him and the crucifixion and why he came, which is a very important thing for us to understand. You know, Isaiah says in other areas of that book, he says, how are you going to be redeemed? Are you going to be redeemed because of your possessions or because of your money? Do you think that those things can redeem you? Well, they can't. But Israel, over and over and over again, well, the Bible uses the word stiff-necked, stubborn people. And when they turn against the Lord, they turn their hearts against God, then they would always suffer terrible consequences for doing it, long-lasting consequences. Horrible things would happen to them. Now, it's interesting if you uh, look at this because this passage that I just read to you, we find it in the book of Acts. And uh, in the book of Acts in chapter 8, a few verses I'm going to read to you here, 32 through 35. Well, let me just give you some background. So Philip, Philip is one of the converts. He's become a man of God. He's sensitive to what God's will is for his life. And when you look at uh, uh, verse 26, it says that the angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, Arise and go towards the south along the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Hmm, interesting. All these uh, locations now are becoming very familiar to us as we see current events taking place. But he says here, this is desert. And so he arose and he went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all of her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. And he's returning, and he's sitting in his chariot, and he's reading from the book of Isaiah. This guy had come to Jerusalem for a spiritual experience. He came to meet God. And you got to know, as he's leaving Jerusalem and going home, he's bummed. He didn't get what he came for. He wasn't able to get that. And here he is reading this passage out of the book of Isaiah. And so the Spirit speaks to Philip and says, run up there and catch up with that guy. And as he approaches him, he hears him reading. And he said, do you understand, Philip said, what you're reading? And he said, how can I understand unless someone guides me? And so he asked Philip to come and sit with him. Now here's our passage. The place in Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this, of himself or some other man? And so Philip opened his mouth and he began at this scripture in Isaiah and he preached Jesus to him. And as they went down the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? So Philip was obedient to the Lord. Philip didn't tell the eunuch, well, Mr. Eunuch, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to make sure that you pay your tithes, you need to make sure you join the right church, you need to do all these different requirements. No, he wanted to know, can I be baptized? And what is the requirement for me to be baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Of course, this is after the crucifixion. This takes place after the resurrection. 
But this is a really fine example for us this morning as we are introduced to Philip of how just a regular person can be used in such a mighty way. This fellow, the eunuch, had a lot of authority and a lot of privilege. And he goes back to his hometown with Jesus in his heart. Now, we don't know exactly what happened to him after that, but we do know that there's a, there was a humongous revival. The Ethiopian Christian church is quite large. Maybe this is the guy that uh, planted that church in the very beginning. Very likely that that's who, this, that's who this guy was. And so Philip, being obedient to the Lord, he invites this fellow to come to know Jesus, the Lamb of God. We hear that phrase a lot. Even John the Baptist used this phrase. If we look over in, uh, in the Gospel of John in chapter 1, um, in verse 29, I believe we got here. John is baptizing people. And here comes Jesus out of the wilderness. And John sees Jesus coming toward him. And he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John knew who he was. Jesus knew who he was. I think the question is this morning, do we know who he is, right? Pretty important question when you think about it. And so we read, you know, I shared with you how in Isaiah he's asking the question, do you think your riches can save you? Do you think you can buy salvation and eternal life through the things that you possess or the church that you belong to? No. The answer is obviously no. And so now we have this thing that we need to understand, how can I be saved? If I can't be good enough, how can I be saved? Now, Peter, over in the book of 1 Peter, um, talks about this very thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, in verse 18, it says, Knowing this, that you were not redeemed, with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you, who through him Believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and your hope are in God. That's a great thing to know this morning. Where is your hope? Where is your faith? You get up in the morning and you think, boy, I'm going to go through this day and really don't know what's ahead or what's going to come. You know, we have to walk in faith, don't we? We have to say, Lord, whatever comes today, let me have my eyes fixed upon you. When I'm driving down the road, I have a problem watching where I'm going sometimes. And when my wife's in the car, she's always, keep your eyes on the road. (laughs) Well, it's pretty out here. You're driving by the hills and the vineyards and the green fields. And, you know, you're driving along at 75, I mean, 55 miles an hour. And, you know, and you're looking over here. And next thing you know, the car starts drifting over the line. You got to get back over in your lane. You know, where we're looking is where we go. That's just how it is. If my eyes are on the prize, if my eyes are on the road, then I'm not going to veer off into trouble. But so many times it's so easy for us when our problems and our troubles begin to come in to our lives, on our journey down the highway, if you will, that we begin to stare at our problems and our weaknesses our shortcomings, and it begins to take us off course. And it's so important for us to remember, I got to stay on course. I got to remember why Jesus died for me and that he is the Lamb of God. And it was before time even began that Jesus knew that he was going to come and die for your sin. That blows my mind. 
As a matter of fact, it even goes one step further. Even before the world was created, God knew that you would become his child. Now, some of us have been a little stiff-necked in the process, probably, right? We may bounce off the walls now and then, but, you know, we find our way. We get back on the road. We get back to the task at hand. And today, you guys, the task at hand is really, really important. He was chosen You were chosen. He was revealed in these last times. Now, this is 2,000 years ago, and Peter's saying it's the last times. They believe that they were in the the last days even during this period of time. So how much closer can we be today? John, in one of the letters that he wrote, he said, whoever is looking for the coming of the Lord purifies themselves so that when he does come, we won't be ashamed. He could come at any minute. He could come and take us while we're here, in the night, at work. He's going to come when you don't expect it. So it's always a good thing to know I'm longing to see Jesus. And when he does come, I don't want to be hanging my head. I don't want to be in the back of the crowd hoping he doesn't notice me. I want to be able to go up and receive from him. And look into his eyes. Because that's what I've longed for my whole life. To look into his face. To see the grace and the love that he has. What point am I making to you this morning? Well, that Jesus is the fulfillment of of prophecy. That he is the Lamb of God. And not only was he the Lamb of God, but he's the creator of heaven and earth too. He's the creator of all things. Some people really balk at that one. No, no, he's just God's little son. No, he's not just God's little son. The Bible tells us he created all things. As a matter of fact, the first chapter of the Gospel of John tells us that very clearly. Now, over in the book of Revelation, I have a couple more I want to share with you here. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, it says this. John speaking, he says, As I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. So John has, is having this vision in heaven, and he's seeing the lamb as though it had been slain. And, and as he's looking at this It tells us that John was weeping because of what he was seeing. And one of the angels touched him and said, John, don't cry. And he looked back over at this lamb, and he says, it was a lion. It was the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so from John's perspective, he saw a crucified lamb. But from God's perspective, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He fulfills all of these things in our lives. And if we jump down to verse 11, it says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. That's who we serve, you guys, this morning. That's who we are serving when we say, I am a Christian. Now, this woman, I have to get to this because it's part of our text. So this woman, as uh, he's in Bethany, And it would appear that he, in this particular uh, instance, um, he was at the house of Simon the leper. Now, you know how people try to grab things in the Bible and say, hey, hey, look, one gospel says this, another gospel says this. They're contradicting each other, therefore they're no good, throw it out. Well, there's a scripture in John during this period of time in the story Uh, where it says, now we know that our text, it says it was two days 
um, before the Passover. Well, in John's story, it's six days before the Passover. And he's not at Simon's house, the leper. He's at Lazarus' house with, Beth, with Martha and Mary in Bethany. And again, we see that it was, I can't believe it was Martha or Mary, one of the two, who had this alabaster box and brought it over, and she poured the oil on Jesus. So a lot would say, hey, is it, the, is it two days or six days? Is it that guy's house or that guy's house? Well, you know what? Isn't it possible it could have been both? One took place six days before. The other one takes place two days before. I think it's safe to say that we can still trust God's word. It's a different house. It's very clear when you read the text. And so she comes in and she's pouring out this oil. Now, in John, it tells us that it was Judas who objected to the fact that that oil was being wasted, being poured out on Jesus. That just shows you where Judas' heart was. He didn't realize who Jesus was. He either didn't realize it or he didn't want to know it, one or the other. All he's caring about is money. And isn't it interesting that Jesus made him the treasurer of the group? You're the most greedy of all these guys, so I'm going to make you in charge of our finances, right? Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He always does. So the woman comes in, and she opens this fragrant oil and poured it on Jesus, and it poured it on her head, and you can just imagine it running down through his hair and onto his shoulders, onto his body. And that's what he said, in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. She knew somehow that she would not be able to do that after he had died. And we know that they rushed to get him off the cross and crammed him into this tomb before they had a chance to do the things that they do with a dead body. To, to fill it with fragrant oils and cover it and do all these different things that they would do. That opportunity wasn't given to them. And perhaps in some way she knew that and she's doing it at this moment to him. And, of course, Jesus said, Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the world, that this, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. That's pretty cool, don't you think? This woman, not sure who she is at this, at this, in this text, but Jesus tells us her name's going to go down in history. And every time you read about this story, you're going to read about this woman. That's pretty cool. How would you like that if you did something really cool and the Lord said, I'm going to stick that in my book, and I'm going to remember it forever, and I'm going to read it over and over again. Well, there is a book like that. It's called the Book of Life. And it's very interesting because if your name is not written in the Book of Life, you got a serious problem this morning. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, your name is written in the Book of Life, and your story is there. And God knows it. He knows exactly how we found our way to the cross. Many of us in many different ways we came. Some of us came through religion. Some of us were part of a religion for, you know, many years of our lives. And that's all we knew. It was repetition and uh, no, no warmth, no reality, just going through the motions. Some of us had a really rough time in life and we got broken you know, the eunuch, I think that the eunuch came to Jerusalem hoping for a spiritual awakening, and he did not get it. And people go to church all the time hoping for a, a spiritual awakening, and they don't get it. And they go years and years and years, and they still stay in the same place, and it's all dried up, and they still don't know the Lord. And then they discover Jesus. The Lord calls them. He beckons to them. And suddenly they have a relationship with God, not religion, but a personal relationship. That's what we want to have, you guys, a personal relationship. It doesn't matter if you were part of a church, if you were a drug addict, if you were a criminal. It doesn't matter where you came from. When we get to the cross, we're all the same. We're all the same. Nobody's worse than anybody else. 
We've all missed the mark together. And isn't it a cool thing to just embrace one another and say, isn't God's grace awesome? You know, I mean, I came from this background and you came from this background and we're totally different from each other, but here we are together and we're in unity with one another because of what Jesus has done. That's powerful. That's why I love you guys so much because you're so diverse. You come from so many different places. It's really cool to hear your stories and give God the glory for them. So now Judas takes that big step. He goes over to the chief priests that had already offered him money. They count out 30 pieces of silver to Judas. And from that moment, Judas began to look for a way to betray the Lord. 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver was the cost at the market for a common slave. So Judas betrays Jesus for the money that would be spent on purchasing a slave. Pretty humble stuff there. I mean, perhaps if it was you or I, maybe we would be saying, really, couldn't you have gone for at least 60 pieces of silver? Am I not worth 100 pieces of silver? No, just give me 30 and I'll be satisfied. And we all know what happened to this man. We all know his end, which of course was not very good at all. But Jesus makes this comment in here in verse 11. He says, for you have the poor with you always. True. But me, you do not have always. He's trying to show them something really important here. Yeah, life's tough. Yes, everybody doesn't get healed. Everybody doesn't get rich. Everybody doesn't stay handsome and good looking for 90 years. Okay? Life's tough. Let's face it. And Jesus did wonderful things when he was on this earth, before he was crucified. He rose the dead. He healed people. He gave the blind sight. He let the lame walk. He spoke out against corruption. And they were afraid of him. Those who did not know him. I think the message this morning is the same. Life is hard. We don't always get it our way. It's not Burger King, right? But you know what I do believe? I believe that God has a great life for us, no matter what we go through. I've watched people, and so have you, and it's heart-wrenching to think about it, but... We've watched people be diagnosed. And we've watched them go through the process together. And we've loved them. And we lose them. And it really hurts. And sometimes the question's raised, why didn't God heal that person? We've been praying and praying and praying. And they're not going to be healed. You know, when something like that happens in our lives, I think that we cannot think that the person wasn't healed because they received the ultimate healing. They will never be sick again. They will never be in pain again. They will have a brand new healthy bodies. That's awesome. So whether we go in the rapture or whether we take our last breath, whether it's from a disease or an accident or whatever, we're all bound for glory. We're all going to get there together. And I'm telling you, you're going to know one another when you get there. It's going to be an awesome reunion. So Now, maybe this this morning you're sitting here thinking, I'm not going to make it to heaven. I've just done too many wrong things. But I want you to know this morning that God can forgive all sin. All sin. Nothing goes over the board except when we deny him. That's the only thing. Everything else is forgivable. Even murder. Maybe you're in here this morning and you feel kind of distant from the Lord. Perhaps after service or maybe during the last couple songs, you might want to get prayed for. And of course, we make this invitation every Sunday. But we'll continue to do that. If you want to get prayed for, Lonnie and Chris are going to be over here. 
They would love to pray with you, whatever it might be about. So let me encourage you guys. We're living in awesome times right now. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. We're living in uncertain times. But one thing that is certain, God is in control. He knows exactly what he's doing, so fear not, people of God. He has it. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you right now. Let's have the worship team come up. I'm sorry. Father, I want to thank you right now, the fact that you do have it in the palm of your hand, that you have us in the palm of your hand, that you know exactly the number of our days, that you're in full control of all things. And even though it seems so chaotic, even though there's so much anger and hatred, your plan is being fulfilled each day, draws us closer to that day when we will see Jesus face to face. And I want to pray for each one of us, Lord, that you would give us that longing in our hearts to never let anything come between us. No troubles, no money, no, no nothing that would come between you and us, Lord that we might have that relationship with you, that we might be awaiting your appearing and ready. So thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For I know